Hi everyone, welcome or welcome back to the Unsolved Society. My name is Maddie and today's case is yet another strange one. And it's oftentimes begged the question, was Marion Barter a lady of mystery or was something more sinister responsible for the bizarre events leading up to her disappearance? Well now, more than 22 years later, due to a recent breakthrough, we may finally know the answer. Her bizarre movements have meticulously been dissected from the thousands of dollars in bank withdrawals to the eerie name change only discovered years later. Her own daughter has led the effort for answers throughout the years and maybe just cracked the case. Buckle up as we dive into the mysterious unsolved case of Marion Barter. Before we jump into all the details of this case, if you are a fan of true crime or unsolved mysteries, please consider liking this video or subscribing to my channel for weekly video uploads. Very helpful to a smaller growing channel like this one. Marion Barter was born as Marion Wilson on October 3rd, 1945 to Jack and Colleen Wilson and was one of four daughters to the couple. She was known to love ballet, opera, and all the finer things in life. During her adult life, Marion struggled to find the love of her life that we're all so desperate for. She was first married in 1967 to a professional football player by the name of Johnny Warren, but they divorced in 1969. In 1973, Marion became pregnant with her first child and gave birth to a daughter named Sally, followed shortly by a son named Owen in 1974. She ended up marrying her children's father, Stuart Brown, in 1977 before they divorced in 1979. Her final marriage was in 1985 to a man named Ray Barter, but they ended up divorcing in 1990. As you can probably imagine, these failed relationships really took a toll on Marion. She just wanted to be loved. And in 1994, after her divorce, Barter purchased a home in Miranda Court in Southport for $180,000 and began to work as a school teacher at the nearby Southport School. She was a very well-loved teacher who was even awarded the Queensland Excellence Teaching Award in 1996 for the dedication to her students. In 1997, Marion made what seems like a sudden decision to quit her job and sell her home. She sold her home in a quick sale for $165,000 in late April. According to some reports, her home was only on the market for three weeks before she decided to sell it for $15,000 less than what she bought it for, suggesting that she felt some urgency to offload the property. A couple months later, in June 1997, Marion submitted a resignation letter to the school where she worked. In the letter, she stated that she planned to travel and find a teaching position in London, England. She also requested to have her teaching license renewed for another year. It was at this time, loved ones say that Marion became uncharacteristically secretive, noting that this was not like her. Sally talks about a time where she was with her fiancé and ran into her mother at a gas station. Her mother had an unknown man with her at the car at the time. When Marianne noticed her daughter, she sped off. It was around this time that Marianne told her loved ones she would be taking a year-long vacation to England and planned to travel throughout different parts of Europe during her time there. She gave her daughter and other people some of her possessions like her car and various furniture and put the remainder of her belongings into a storage unit. And on June 22nd, 1977, Marion was driven by her good friend Leslie to the Southport bus station where she planned to catch a bus to the Brisbane International Airport. Leslie would be the last known person to see Marion alive. Over the following few months, Marion sent letters and postcards to her daughter and an elderly relative. And on August 1st, 1997, she called Sally, her daughter, from a payphone in Tunbridge Wells. The two spoke until Marion ran out of coins for the call. According to Sally, there was no sign that anything was wrong. Her mother sounded normal. This phone call, however, would turn out to be the last time Sally ever spoke to her mother. I'd like to take a moment to invite you to subscribe to my channel and formally become an official solver at the Unsolved Society. Official solvers must have an eagerness to learn about unsolved true crime and mysteries, but also be willing to commit at least 20 minutes a week watching a new video by yours truly about some of the most bizarre unsolved cases in history. I don't think that's asking too much, right? So subscribe today for new weekly unsolved true crime and mystery videos and become an official solver today. When Marion didn't call her son Owen on his birthday on October 23rd, 1997, everyone began to worry about her. This was unusual for Marion. She would never forget to call one of her children on their birthdays. 
and realized that they actually had no idea where Marion could be at this time. Concerned about her mother, Sally Layden began to search by contacting the Commonwealth Bank where her mother had accounts. She let them know that she had not heard from her and they believed that she was currently overseas. However, they informed Sally that over a three-week period in August and September, $5,000 was withdrawn daily in Byron Bay and Burley Heads. She then made an electronic transfer to an unknown bank account on October 15th for $80,000. This information was jarring. Marion's loved ones had thought she was in Europe, so it made no sense that she'd be withdrawing money in Australia. That final $80,000 transfer is Marion's last known movement. There has been no proof of life since. I'll note that Burley Heads is less than 13 miles from the school where Marion previously worked and less than an hour's drive from where her daughter lived. So Sally jumped in her car and drove to Byron Bay with a photo of her mother. She canvassed the area asking businesses and locals if they had seen Marion anywhere. It was at this time she reported her mother as a missing person to the Byron Bay police station. During their investigation, police spoke to a bank teller who reported that Marion had chatted with her about quote unquote, starting a new life and that she didn't want anyone to know where she was. Now, there is no official police record of this conversation, which is something that has toyed with Sally's mind for decades, but the police expected her daughter to just take this story as fact and move along. They marked Marion's case as an occurrence instead of an actual missing persons investigation. A friend of Sally was actually a customs agent at the time and confirmed that Marion's passport had returned to Australia on August 2nd just a day after the last phone call that she had with Sally. The idea that her mother could have just abandoned their family or that she was possibly met with foul play consumed Marion's loved ones. They couldn't understand why their once attentive mother had presumably cut them off and started a new life. Important life events like weddings and births came and went. Marion's son ended up tragically taking his own life in 2003 but still Sally never heard any word from her mother. She couldn't imagine that she would be staying away when she knew that she needed her the most. So Sally continued the fight for answers by reaching out to organizations like the Salvation Army Tracing Service and the Australian Federal Police Missing Persons Unit and various other police departments and media outlets. Countless news and magazine articles were published, but the mystery of what happened to Marianne persisted but so did Marion's daughter, Sally. During the course of Sally's investigation, she discovered that in May 1997, so one month before her mother left Australia, she changed her name via deed pool to Florabella Natalia Marion Ramakal. And for my fellow Americans who are not familiar with the term deed poll, and by no means am I the expert, but it's a legal document that is basically proclaiming that you've changed your name. And by the looks of it, it seems like it's a fairly simple process. Sally shared this discovery and many others on her podcast, The Lady Vanishes. This podcast has garnered a lot of attention and new eyes on Marion's case. A woman by the name of Joni Condos was one of those many listeners, and she was intrigued by Marion's usage of the name Ramakal. It was a unique name. She tried numerous versions of the name in a search engine, but got nothing. So she tried different combinations of the name, but instead put spaces between some of the letters in different combinations. And she actually got a hit. She found a 1994 Lonely Hearts ad in the Carrier Australian, a French English newspaper. The ad reads, and this is translated from French, so bear with me. 47 years old, single, tall, dark, sober, non-smoker, university, multi-owner, intellectual, polyglot, Motivated and die hard with moral qualities and important assets. Looking for a lady with a free heart. BCBG relationship with or marriage view. Sign Mr. F. Ramakal. The ad also had a phone number that was traced to a business called Bellina Coin Investments, which was owned by a couple named Frederick and Diane Heaterberry. Sally and Joni took this new evidence to the Unsolved Homicide Unit and they created a special task force to pursue Marion's case. Investigators were able to uncover a lapsed Queensland driver's license using the name Fernand Ramakal. The name Fernand Ramakal was traced to Frederick de Hedeveri, which led police to a man named Rick Bloom. 
Upon further investigation, Rick Bloom had changed his name via deed poll 11 times and used over 50 aliases over the years. He was also a convicted con man who had served time for fraud in the 1970s. This obviously piqued investigators' interests. So now, 83-year-old Bloom was called in for questioning in regards to Marion Barter's disappearance. The purpose of the inquest is what it's called, is for the coroner to review presented findings and determine if the person that they're talking about is deceased, and if applicable, also determine the date and the manner of death. However, this is not a trial, and it is not the coroner's role to attribute blame or punish any individual. Rick Bloom appeared to be rather frazzled during his court appearance, or maybe he was just leaning into the I'm a fragile old man bit. I'm not sure. Reports claim that his hands appeared to be shaking and he went on inappropriate tangents and much of what he said was kind of compared to ramblings. However, he did seemingly admit to having a brief affair with Marion in early 1997, although he was married at the time. He claims that the two met through the Lonely Hearts ad that he posted and that the relationship was not serious. He said that the two only saw each other a handful of times. Which is very hard to believe considering the following travel information that was revealed during the inquest. But according to records, Bloom flew out of Australia under the name Richard Lloyd Westerbury on June 17, 1997. Marion flew out of Australia days later on June 22, 1997. And on July 31, 1997, Bloom returned to Australia, followed by Marion on August 2, 1997. Wow, what a coincidence. But it doesn't stop there. On October 14th, 1997, Rick Bloom opened a safe custody envelope at the Commonwealth Bank in Bellina. I imagine this is similar to what we call safety deposit boxes here in the U.S. Anyways, coincidentally, this was only one day before Marion electronically transferred that large lump sum of $80,000 and Bloom ended up closing that envelope a little less than two weeks later. Just when you thought it couldn't get any more suspicious, three separate women came forward with allegations that this was actually a pattern of behavior for Bloom and that they all had very similar circumstances, including that they were all recently divorced and owned property. But strangely enough, Bloom used a different name in every single one of those relationships. One woman by the name of Jeanette Gaffney Bowen, now 76 years old, knew Bloom as Frederick de Hedeveri and two met him through an ad in the newspaper. She recalled a rather whirlwind romance, if you can call it that. On their first date, Bloom told Jeanette that he had recently lost his home, so Jeanette offered to let Bloom live in a studio that she had in her garden. As time went on, Frederick approached her with the idea of starting a rare coin business, and Jeanette agreed. She gave him her bank card to take care of expenses for the business. He would go on to withdraw over $30,000 from that bank account. And much like Marianne, he pressured Jeanette to sell her home in Sydney and purchase an apartment in Paris. But when she refused, he began to blackmail her with nude photos. Nude photos that Jeanette believes he took while she was drugged. Wow, sounds like a real piece of <laughs> But Bloom continued to terrorize her and ended up stealing valuables from her home. She finally went to the police and filed for a restraining order. She was quoted as saying, He was making a living by zeroing in on vulnerable females. He was looking for women who were alone. I believe he could emotionally destabilize as well as financially ruin a person without any care on his part. That was just one of the three women's stories that alleged Rick Bloom targeted them as romantic partners and would go to great lengths to try to financially profit from them. Another woman named Monique Cornelius revealed shocking details about her alleged relationship with him. That possibly explains where he got the alias Fernand Ramakal. Letters were read during the inquest that were written by Bloom addressed to Monique. In the letters, Bloom claimed to be a British special agent who wanted to whisk Monique away to start a new life together. The salacious love letters show Bloom professing his love, quote unquote, for Monique. He states that he is leaving the UK in a few days to go purchase a 40-foot boat for the two of them and reiterates how badly he wants her to leave and start a new life with him, quote unquote. During the inquest, she was quoted as saying, Frederick is always lying. He does not tell the truth to those around him. 
He invents and tells stories and always other stories constantly always to cover his tracks and thus hide the truth about his own actions and his true goals and interest. That's how he manipulates. He manipulated me and lied to me. For example, at the beginning of our relationship, he told me he worked for the British Embassy in Luxembourg as a special agent. To me, he's a very big and dangerous manipulator. When questioned about the letter, Bloom admitted that it was his handwriting, but denied the validity of its contents. And when asked if he could acknowledge the manipulative nature of responding to personal ads for women looking for romantic relationships while he was married with children, he responded, it may be deceptive, yes. Throughout the hearings, Rick Bloom feverishly denied those accusations when questioned if he killed Marion Barter. But in the final days of the inquest, he made a bizarre accusation that she may still be alive. When asked why he thought that, he recalled a conversation he had with her at her home in Queensland, where she allegedly said, quote unquote, she had enough of her family. When further questioned about this conversation, Bloom was not able to give any more details, but he did add that Marion was, quote unquote, a bit of a strange person. However, on February 29th, 2024, after reviewing the findings presented in the inquest, coroner Teresa O'Sullivan officially declared Marion Barter deceased. While the coroner is unable to give an exact date or cause of death, they agree that Bloom has demonstrated a pattern of exploiting women. The report goes on to state that Mr. Bloom traveled to England to spend time with Marion when he clearly did not intend to pursue the relationship because he was married with children and living in New South Wales. I do not accept as accurate anything Mr. Bloom has said in evidence in absence of independent corroborating evidence. The coroner even went on to dispute the validity of the alleged conversation Marion and Rick had about her having enough of her family noting that there is a great likelihood that this was just a crude attempt to distance himself from Marion and the circumstance of his relationship. The coroner's findings closed with an assessment of the prior police investigation into Marion's disappearance. They stated that the investigation conducted between 1997 and 2019 was not adequate and recommended that her case remain with the State Crime Command Unsolved Homicide Team for further investigation. Today, Sally Marion's daughter still has no clear answers about what happened to her mother, but the coroner's recent decision has been confirmation that she is on the right track. She was quoted as saying, I need to find her. Simple. I just can't sit here and get on with my life, she said. My heart literally aches with anxiety every time I talk about it. I need that pain to stop before it stops me. If you would like to hear a more in-depth version of Marion's story and Sally's journey for answers, Sally has a podcast, like I mentioned before, called The Lady Vanishes, and it has gone on from 2019 and then just ended this year in 2024. But I highly recommend it. I will put a link in the video's description. And I hope that the recent breakthroughs, along with the continued coverage of Marion's case, helps to bring those long-awaited answers that I know that Sally and many, many others are still fighting so diligently for. Before we wrap up this week's video, I just want to ask for recommendations for lesser known unsolved missing persons or murder cases. My first video on this channel was about Fauna Fry's case, which hasn't gotten as much attention as it deserves. And I know that there are thousands of cases just like hers out there. So please let me know down in the comments what lesser known case that you want me to cover next. But thank you very, very much for watching. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for more unsolved true crime and mystery videos. And I will see you solvers in the next one. Bye.